Yeah, hi everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, good. Um, okay, I'm going to um, be talking from a, an ECHO perspective. As you know, ECHO is a humanitarian donor, and so we have a certain um, uh, fission, let's say, between our development side and our humanitarian side that we are trying to grapple with. So I'm going to focus quite a lot on that because I think it's quite interesting from the point of view of of uh, the, the resilience um, agenda, but also how development and humanitarian actually can come together. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe starting in a way, uh, the other panelists have, have already sort of mentioned this a little bit, but the, the conceptual battle is over in a sense. I think everybody's agreed that you know, resilience and uh, you know, it's the way to go. Um, that's why you're all here, presumably. Um, so, so I, I don't, th you know, if we were having this discussion a couple of years ago, I think it would be a very different one. We'd be struggling to think about what it is and all that sort of stuff. So we're, we are actually quite a long way down the road, I think, which is, which is quite encouraging. Um, but, you know, the, the, one of the central parts, especially from an ECHO perspective, is, is this humanitarian working with development. And, um, you know, if we are to work to better together, then we, we really do have to look at the institutional issues. Um, to really take it away, I think you mentioned also Sunday, the, 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 uh, the tendency for individuals to drive the process rather than institutions to drive the process. So those, those are the kind of issues that I think are, are important to bring out. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how resilience has to some extent been um, institutionalised within the EU, that's DEVCO and ECHO in a sense. Um, but then I also want to talk about how that is being supported in target countries and regions, because I think that's a really important element too. And then I'll try to bring out some, some of the big, big questions and, and where we need to go. So in terms of the, the EU, um, as a bureaucracy, the first thing we do is produce uh, a policy paper. So that was done in 2012. Um, it was fairly generic, um, had good stuff in it. It was but it was pretty shallow. Fortunately, that was added to with a plan of action about um, six months later for 2013 to 20 period, which actually did commit the EU as a whole to certain agendas, which, which largely have been adhered to. But again, they're, they're fairly generic. Um, that they're around supporting national resilience um, efforts within national development plans. Um, innovation, learning and advocacy, and methodologies and, and tools for, to support resilience. So those are the kind of like the main um, highlights in that plan of action. Okay, again, full of good, good stuff on the whole. The third element, and, and again, it's a, a bureaucratic process, if you like, is, is a, an instruction letter um, that was sent out from, from DEVCO Commissioner and ECHO Commissioner together with um, the program head of, of the External Action Service in the EU as well. So it's you know, that, that top level EU um, management. Um, and it was signed off by all the member states. Okay, so 26 member states of the European Union. So quite, a, quite an important document. And it's essentially, it's not you know, uh, legally binding or anything, but it, it's encouraging all of um, the different elements of the EU and member states to work together around resilience. And it does talk to, um, I can just quote a little bit, strongly encourages EU delegations, member state embassies and missions and ECHO field offices to reflect together on the application of the resilience approach in their programs in a coordinated and a coherent way to maximize, uh, to the maximum st extent possible. And it talks about humanitarian development, it talks about multi-sectoral, multi-level, all the things that we've kind of collectively been talking about over the last few, two or three years. Right, so we, we have, it sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, you've got a top-level policy, you've got a kind of like a plan of action, which is time-bound and, and has certain commitments within it. You've got a letter from the top level of management in the whole institution with 26 member states on board saying, let's go for it and do it. But, <laughs> and this is the <laughs> big so issue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but it's actually really rare that it happens on the ground. Um, one example, and I've got Tim here. Tim and I actually went to Zimbabwe a couple of months ago. 
Mm. Um, and joined with, with the um, ECHO, DEVCO and DFID people on the ground and developed, or it's still in draft form and being circulated and so on, but a draft strategy um, for resilience in Zimbabwe. That is about the first time that I know that that's actually happened. And whilst we can congratulate ourselves <laughs> and say, good job, the question is, why hasn't that happened everywhere? Yeah. So, so those are some of the issues I think we really need to look at. Um, and, you know, the question is, why is it so difficult? You know, why, why hasn't this happened everywhere? And really, when you start looking at, you know, starting to dig a little bit in there, certainly, you know, we've really realised this from the ECHO perspective, that we have a completely different culture in ECHO to DEVCO. All right? We are the humanitarians. We go in there fast and, and furious and try to, to save lives and possibly save livelihoods as well. And DEVCO is, is a much longer term, very much more... Uh, uh, I don't know, thoughtful perhaps, um, you know, very much long-term strategies and so on, very inflexible. Um, but, you know, in, and it, it's very, very different cultures. So you have two different kind of like missing um, personalities in a sense, which does make it difficult, which is why perhaps some individual attempts have succeeded because people have clicked. Um, also, you know, it's very clear that there are very different paradigms from a humanitarian equity-based paradigm to a, a growth, economic growth model that, that DEVCO is, is mostly engaged with. So you tend to be focusing on different people, right? So ECHO would tend to focus on the most vulnerable. DEVCO would tend to focus on the people with more development potential. They're two, two different, completely different communities. In Kenya, for example, and actually, this is where things have changed. You would have DEVCO inf investing in, in the highlands of Kenya because that's where the economic potential is, not in the lowlands, which is where ECHO is working um, with partners to, you know, in the periodic droughts. Yeah, two completely different parts of the country, different communities and everything. But it has changed because DEVCO is now actually very much more balanced in, it, in its investment. So it is investing in, in the lowlands now. So things are changing. It's not that it's impossible. But it's slow. Um, funding cycles is another thing, and and perhaps the competences of staff is something that we'll come to later as well. Are we are, are we fit for purpose in a sense of, of driving the resilience agenda forward? So uh, those are some some issues. I'm aware that I don't have very much time here, and I've um, got quite a lot more to say. But anyway, um, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, the importance of the institutionalization process in target countries and, and in regions, because I think this is really, really important. And whilst we tend to be rather kind of like inward looking at our own organizations, you know, how are we doing? You know, really the, the issue is, 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 you know, in, in the Somalis and Kenyas and the Sahel and IGAD and, um, uh, you know, the, the institutions in those countries. They are responsible to ultimately for the well-being of their citizens and they will probably be more resilient to changing in policy away from resilience perhaps in a few years' time when the, the humanitarian and donor community kind of like move away from it. Perhaps they will keep it going much longer than we will. So I think it's really, really worth the investment there. And it's no mistake that there is the, the, the top line in the, the EU plan of action is to support national resilience efforts and that includes um, institutionalization and building institutions that can support it so very quickly i mean it, uh, the, the main areas so far as as in common with with uh, usaid and DFID has been um, perhaps a little wider actually in DFID, but the sahel and and the horn of africa um, there's been quite a substantial investment over over the last couple of years in terms of money there's something like 270 million gone into the Horn of Africa over a couple of years, and 1.5 billion is going into the AGIA program mm -hmm. uh, loosely, which is you know, substantial money over, over two or three years. So there is, there is investment, um, but there's also a kind of you know, an attempt to, to build on what <coughs> national governments have, have developed themselves. So very much in the Horn of Africa, which is where I have more knowledge, um, the ending drought emergencies, um, sort of movement almost um, took place in, in the, the Horn of Africa region. Four of those policies have been or plans have been approved and there's four more are still sort of ongoing. Um, I think that's a similar process in, uh, in West Africa with 17, yeah, right, <laughs> with 17 different countries and blah, blah, blah. So what I'm saying is that th that's where we're, we're kind of like you need to put the investment. 
in developing those, those, uh, those programs. So, I just want to finish up with some, some, um, some, some of the bigger questions, perhaps. Um, you know, when you look at what has worked quite well, I was going to talk a tiny bit about Ethiopia as we are here. Um, and this is going to be talked about in the next session. I think Johan's standing at the back there, who's our um, head of office in, in ECHO. He's going to be presenting on the detail of the program at 2 o'clock. So if you're interested in that example, then go to that meeting. But it's a very much a, um, a joint ECHO-DEVCO um, uh, collaboration towards building resilience in, in, in the most vulnerable areas of Ethiopia. And it's, but, you know, again, it's working. It's, it's one of those sort of um, examples of it stand out, partly because it's not working elsewhere. Um, and that's mainly because of the individuals concerned. So I think the whole institutionalization process has to draw us away from <coughs> that so that we're, we're getting much more systematized. Um, so that's one of the big issues. Perhaps that's the biggest one. Uh, it's very interesting hearing from, from other uh, donors how they've managed to get around that. And perhaps one way forward would be to actually have a more, you know, longer term, more formal sharing of, of how to institutionalize uh, resilience more effectively. Because we've all been trying. It's work in progress, as, as Greg was saying. Um, you know, but should we, should we actually take stock and, and try to work out what would be the best way forward? Um, Competences of staff does come back a lot. You know, it's partly mindsets and it's partly, you know, skills and competences. People are comfortable within a um, their, their kind of like envelope of of expertise and experience, and, and sometimes scared to move away from that. Don't have the skills in some cases. I think your example of of how Rockefeller have, has invested in leaders is a very interesting approach. Um, you know, those people are actually driving change. So can that be supported institutionally? I think that's a really interesting model. Um, I'll leave it there because I'm taking up time and Tim nodding. <laughs> Shut up. Thanks. Thanks um, yeah, thank you.